Welcome, everybody. This is the Rotary Club of Silicon Valley, and every week we bring you the stories of people who are working to make a difference in the lives of others locally, globally, and digitally. We're part of Rotary International, 1.4 million Rotarians and Rotaractors around the world, some 36,000 plus Rotary Clubs, and our focus is service. So if you are one of those people who's like, how do I get involved with other people who are who are interested in making the world better. Rotary.org is one way to do it. If you want to find our club, you can get there uh, in terms of a shortcut by rotary.cool. <laughs> now, the program today is, is a program that, uh, that I heard about through one of our members, Shag Shagrin, who's on the call. And, uh, and, and in reading about the work of, of James Rose at the University of Tennessee, uh, I, I, Got excited about some of the some of the different projects that his group is doing, and I will read one sentence from the bio. Usually, I just direct you to the bio under our YouTube uh, video or above our embed on our SiliconValleyRotary.com page. But today, got to read it. The charge of the Institute for Smart Structures is to research architectural applications of emerging technologies for sustainability and to explore those applications through design build projects that engage students faculty, and industry partners. Those of you who have been watching these recordings for a long time will know immediately that this is something that Russian wanted to hear more about. With that, I will hand it over to our speaker, James Rose. James, welcome to the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Thank you so much, Russian, and, and thank you, Shags. And, and unfortunately, you, you stole my first line of the presentation. So I'm, I'm going to have to, you know, come off the cuff a little bit here. But I'm Super thrilled to be here today, uh, representing the Institute for Smart Structures. Um, so as you've already mentioned, we are an institute that partners with um, local industry usually, but often global with local kind of um, tendrils. Uh, but the intention is we bring everything back to the studio. So we have a core curriculum in the College of Architecture and Design that's built around studio education. So all the projects you'll see are student designed, often student fabricated and student constructed. And the intention is that we bring uh, value both to the students and to the partners that we work with. Uh, I'm going to be going over several projects that's by no means all, and it's going to be quite a bit of an overview. So I'm looking forward to some questions at the end, but I'll go ahead and jump in. So uh, we began the Institute in 2009. Um, we started on a very small project that was sort of a test case to give us a sense of whether or not we had the bandwidth to do the type of projects we were interested in. And we started with a very simple question. At a residential scale, what happens when you combine passive thermal and solar electric? Can you actually make a net zero prototype? So we started kind of thinking at the level of building orientation. If you face a space south, it's a direct gain space. Can you make it switchable? In which case we did. So in the summer orientation, we're exhausting heat from that, that uh, kind of south facing winter garden, you could call it. And in the winter, we're driving that gain inside. And therefore, for heating, we only have to use our solar electric powered heat pump a little bit to get us to a comfort level. And we built this thing. So we did it on a shoestring budget. We did it with student design and student uh, student construction. Quality was amazing. We got lots of good feedback on this. And lo and behold, it worked as we intended. So that sort of gave us the uh, em uh, emphasis to go on to the next project, which we're, you know, in the, in the days of solar decathlon, we we're always interested in doing this. So this was sort of the first time we built something completely full scale. This is three times larger than the UT0 that we showed you. It is truly a small dwelling for a couple. Uh, it is compact. It's energy positive. It produces more power than it needs. Uh, it's portable. It's a small scale. It's small footprint, but it's also small in terms of the way the interior works and actually feels bigger than it actually is. So this was our, our uh, award-winning um, entry into the 2011 Department of, entry, uh, De Department of Energy Solar Decathlon. This went on to win, I think, uh, three first place prizes where eight out of, out of 20 did quite well. But basically as a demonstrator of the technology we were interested in, which is the combining of passive and active systems, I think it's unique. Uh, so we started with a small footprint. We have two solid cores that uh, define all of the stuff you can't move. So we have laundry room and, and mechanical area, we have kitchen, and then on the other core, we have a fold-up bed and we have a, a bathroom. And then everything else is open space. So it's a reconfigurable 30 by 12 space. 
Um, the intention here is also to make it as transparent as possible without losing energy efficiency. And if possible, allow that transparency to actually provide us with a unique opportunity for greater energy efficiency. And so that's what you see here. So this is the interior of that space. So the exterior walls are completely translucent. Both of them are double facades on the south and the north. And if you'll remember in the diagram I showed you on UT0, that sun space was about four feet deep. Here, we're able to get that down to about 10 inches. And we find that it does exactly the same work in terms of raising temperature or isolating temperature from inside the outside. Um, so what we're finding in the heating mode here is that um, lower angle, Winter sun comes in underneath the overhang of our photovoltaics. It drives about a 30 degree temperature gain. So that means that our uh, electric powered heat pumps only have to give us about a 10 or a 12 degree bump to be comfortable. And then as we exhaust it, we blow some of that uh, air down the north facade to decouple and give us uh, a block against heat loss. And then the cooling mode, the overhang is protecting that south facade from direct gain. And then we switch the direction of the airflow we bring in air on the, the cooler north side, condition that, and then as we exhaust some, we blow a bit down the south facade, it gives us an active R value and further decouples solar gain. So we found over the 10 days of that competition, it worked extremely well. So if you look at that graph at the bottom, the area under the red curve is consumption, the area under the black curve is production. We were able to produce about twice as much power as we needed. So that was fantastic. The other thing to look at is that the peaks don't align, right? This is a known problem with solar systems is that you don't necessarily align your consumption with your production. And we'll address that in an upcoming project. But this sort of uh, created a name for us. It, it kind of made us known for being able to do these net zero projects. Um, one of the interesting things about this particular one is that usually these solar decathlon homes don't end up with a long life cycle. Ours was always intended to go somewhere else when it was done, and in this case, it lives permanently at the Children's Museum in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where it provides about 10,000 watts of power back to the grid, and it is uh, working as a teaching kitchen outside their, their teaching gardens. So, uh, kind of this is all a foreground for what I think, you know, is maybe one of the more pivotal projects uh, in our portfolio. So, around 2014, we were granted a governor's chair, which is an external researcher at the university level, uh, that is outstanding in whatever their field is, and then their job is to partner with Oak Ridge National Laboratory and the University of Tennessee on some of these, these big, nasty problems that we're dealing with. So we were lucky to have the architecture firm of Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill join us on this. And the project that we began was called AMI, which is an acronym for Additive Manufacturing and Integrated Energy. So as that might suggest, there are two primary technologies here. One, the idea of integrated energy, building off of our expertise in net zero structures to make a building paired with an automobile so that maybe we could ameliorate this issue of not producing power when we need it. We can actually make power, store it in the car, and use it in the car. And the other part of this was additive manufacturing or 3D printing at architectural scale, which had just been invented at, at Oak Ridge National Labs. So this is a floor plan of what we were looking at. So this, again, is a small micro-dwelling unit. This time, I think it's really for one person, but we have a fixed island that kind of anchors all of the necessities of life. But then the open space around it is entirely defined by a 3D printed enclosure. And if you look at the thickness in those walls, you're looking at something that's two inches thick, made, it, made up of two surfaces of five eighths of an inch, 3D printed uh, ABS polymer, and in between is a vacuum insulation barrier. So this is one of the C shapes. So the the, the, the project is made up of rings, and this is one C, and this is laying on its side being printed in what was then the world's largest 3D printer at ORNL. In that case, I believe it was 18 by uh, 8 and could print 6 uh, feet tall. And you notice it's also developing what we call the corduroy texture, which is one of the ways you know when something is additively manufactured. So here you can see the, the assembly sequence of these components. So the C's come together to make rings. The rings stack up. And that gives us the chrysalis form of Amy. And you'll notice what's happening is we're getting enclosure, windows, and structure all in the same surface. That's one of the unique things about additive manufacturing. The other part being that you're only using the power you need and the materials you need to make the part. There's no waste. You're not milling away materials. Um, so here you're seeing uh, the, the final piece get erected. They're lifting a ring in place. And notice here, too, that we painted the exterior of this um, because we weren't quite sure how UV would degrade this polymer. And I will talk again about that at a later point. 
So here's a view of the interior. Uh, this again was uh, was very successful. It worked as intended. You can look out the window there and see in the distance that black vehicle is the paired 3D printed uh, uh, electric hybrid vehicle that shares power with the, the home. And you can see in the interior that there's sort of developing a very kind of unique aesthetic resolution. We've got flooring, we have wall, we have structure, window, lighting, HVAC, all part of the same monocoque chassis. And here it is on the exterior. So this project went on to garner multiple awards for engineering and architecture, and it sort of set up an opportunity for us uh, to develop an expertise in additive manufacturing at the scale of architecture. And about the same time we were doing that, the, the firm Local Motors was developing its first micro factory located very close to ORNL in Knoxville, Tennessee. And they contacted us and asked us if we'd be interested in helping them outfit their micro factory with furnishings. So uh, ostensibly what we were asked to create was a screen uh, between a conference room and an open workspace. So we called this the, the trabecula. Uh, and this was around 2017. And so what we're interested in here on our research side is 3D printing is very much unlike any previous form of construction. It doesn't really help us to look back at something else that was a built object, but it does help us to look at organic pressing, to look at something like bone structure, or to look at a seashell, or to look at an insect wing that was created through a process of accretion and deposition. So that's kind of our focus on this project. So the students in this case were looking at uh, human bone, in this case, the trabecular, the fine scale structure, which is sort of like a naturally occurring um, space frame. So the students were able to isolate that geometry and they were able to produce this screen. Now on the side, we're also thinking about this as a structural system. Even though it's, it's used as a screen, this was able to take a massive amount of compressive force. And the other thing that's interesting too is obviously we're looking at how much kind of geometric flexibility do we have? There's really nothing that else that could do this uh, with any sort of budget other than a 3D printed um, structure. So this is our second project with Local Motors. This time they came back and said, we need a reception desk to anchor our showroom as people walk into the building. Uh, and we were uh, asked this time to make something that could only be made by additive manufacturing. Something that really set Local Motors apart was the fact at the time they had the world's largest 3D printer, 60 feet long, 12 feet wide, 12 feet tall. So what we're looking at here is called AMPT, Additive Manufacturing and Parametric Design. And this was done around 2019. So again, looking at organic precedents, but also this time applying some very robust computational design methods. So in this case, the students were inspired by the lace veil mushroom, which creates this sort of Voronoi shape that can expand or contract based on the shape of the mushroom and where it sits on the land. And so the students used that as a surface that then would kind of weave through multiple functions of a desk and a screen wall and a display case and a bench. But this became so complicated geometrically that we had to script it. So what you're seeing there at the top is a script from Grasshopper, which is a plug-in for the CAD system Rhino. And so we're able to actually take a little bit of the weight off of our own shoulders in terms of the geometric uh, kind of resolution of that. But also at the same time, it gave us some robust tools to help us optimize. So going from the model on the desk to the piece you see printing, we're able to reduce the mass by about 40%. Here you can see it as it sits in the local motor showroom. So this is about 20 feet long, about seven feet tall, about 21 components that are all uh, put together in tension. You can also see the screen wall upstairs beyond. Uh, but this I, I think was a, a big moment for us. It let us know that we were onto something, right? So this idea that 3D printing is really the first digital material. It is really a perfect coupling for digital design. We can apply things to this that cannot be applied to any other construction methodology. I think it also proved us that we're onto something with this idea of organic precedent. So oh, the other perk is if you work with local motors every once in a while, you get to go outside and do donuts in the world's first 3D printed electric car. Just thought I would throw that in. All right, so this is our final project. This is Trillium. Uh, this uh, came after the local motors work. This was our own university asking us if we would create a pavilion to anchor the Greenway at our off-campus research park. So the things that are interesting for us, again, are the organic precedents. We're also now making a componentized system that's built outside, not indoors. And we're going to be looking at how it weathers. But then maybe the most interesting thing is this really starts to promise a closed loop life cycle for materials. So here is our great organic precedent, the trillium flower, which is uh, native to our, our area, which is interesting because it's a three lobed flower uh, that is structurally stable because of its double curved geometry. 
So the students are inverting that to give us a three lobed dome. And that's sort of the, the, the basis for the concept. Uh, this was printed at our industry partner, Loci Robotics, uh, which are former engineers from local motors. So to keep that kind of uh, relationship going. And this time it's being printed with a arm instead of a gantry. So this is unlike a desktop printer that has an X and Y, this is actually a robot arm that gives us a whole lot more flexibility. And the, really the, the main interesting thing about this is the material we're printing with, which is 20% uh, carbon fiber reinforced ABS is reclaimed from crash tested local motors vehicles. So this is the second or third go around for this polymer. There's very little degradation in this material from instance to instance. So what this is beginning to promise is a future where we can start to recycle architecture and make architecture again. Potentially we've been recycling the wrong things. Beverage and food containers are difficult to recycle. Maybe architecture and furnishings is what we should be looking at. So here you can see the students erecting this on site. So again, it was componentized. It was made in the factory environment in small pieces. Those were brought out to the site. Those were erected by hand in small components. And then you can see the full size piece sitting there at the head of the greenway. So this is a fascinating structure for us for a lot of reasons, but I think the main thing here is we're gonna watch this thing and see how this weathers because this is the third life of some of this polymer and we're really interested in this closed loop life cycle. So, that gets me to the end of my slides for today, but I'm absolutely happy to get into some questions. And we will happily jump into some questions with you. Fantastic stuff. Thank you so much for, for the, uh, the presentation. I'll, I'll quickly introduce the group that we've got here. If you are in a position to turn your camera on, feel free. Otherwise, just wave uh, at, at, a, at, a, at a camera and we'll, we'll pretend we can see you. Uh, so from our club, we have Shags up in Walnut Creek, our, our paella master, uh, and then a visiting Rotarian and civil engineer, Andrea Mosqueda. All right, good to have you here with us, Andrea. My name is Rushton. I am the, the program chair for the Rotary Club of Silicon Valley, and I'll start the questions. So you, you talk a little bit about the, uh, the at, at one point, about the shoestring budget uh, for for one of the... Uh, one of the projects that that I think won you a lot of awards, right? Now, what are we talking about? You know, so if, if we're looking at the the, the beautiful uh, model, of, I think it's the Living Light model. Um, you know, if if people are thinking in terms of of tiny homes or something like that, if that were commercially available, what would you expect it to run in terms of cost? That's a difficult question to answer. We know what we spent, but we don't know what that would be commercialized. And remember too, this was from 2011. So, you know, over a decade has passed. Uh, at the time, I believe our total project budget for the entire thing was north of a million dollars. But remember that means we had to transport it to site. We had to put students up in a hotel for, for two weeks. We did a lot of other things with it. Mm. And it was not cheap construction. Uh, I, I would myself like to know what a commercialized version of that would cost, and I don't know, but I would guarantee you that it's cheaper than when the than the money we spent on. Uh, no doubt. Well, I mean, with with the with the value of scale that you bring to it, I mean, like if this these things, I'm sure, can be produced very quickly and probably transported fairly fairly easily as well. Right. I, there's a slide I did not include, but this travels down the interstate as the back half of a semi trailer. So that, that's the proportions were di dictated by that. Um, but at the time we had to build our own components that would hook onto the back and the front so that it was basically the stressed member in the middle of that, uh, that trailer. And that cost money, right? But you build that once and you can use that forever after. So there are a lot of kind of uh, nonlinear sorts of, uh, you know, ways to reduce cost on those projects. And it, again, I wish I had a better answer for those. Mm -hmm. The, well, we we interviewed some folks from New Story um, uh, a few years back, and and projects they were doing to do to to build uh, shelter, well, to build homes for areas where there is a a, a dearth of construction for housing, and uh, it's exciting to fo follow their their progress. Although I, I do look at what you've done, and 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 I'm I'm really struck by the aesthetic quality of of the the building as well. When you think about these buildings being interesting visually, if if there were going to be multiple buildings in, in a space. So, you know, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, what you had at the Oak Ridge Lab Laboratory that became, you know, a, a, a contributor to to the 
uh, to the energy uh, required by, you know, by, by the area, but also a test kitchen, you know, this kind of thing. With multiple approaches to this, do, do you end up doing certain things to change the the aesthetics of these or or do you stick with the model? How, how, how do you think about that? Well, I think first that one was a prototype. Uh, we didn't know its orientation exactly and we didn't know its environment that it would finally rest in. So it was not designed to land at the Children's Museum, but that's where it, it, it did end up. So there was sort of a bit of ambiguity there where, where that was going to go. So that, that potentially if it was designed specifically for a site, it might change it. But the other thing I would say is that kind of embedded in the Institute is sort of an ethic of material honesty that we're very uh, interested in expressing what the materials are doing. So when you saw inside that project, everything that looked like wood was wood. And everything that looks like 3D printed polymer is polymer in the later projects. Uh, and I think that's what's exciting is trying to find out the expression of the materials. Um, because I think aesthetic changes as technology changes. You know, there's a reason why the, the Greeks and the Romans were very comfortable with uh, marble. And there's a reason why, uh, you know, we don't use it as much. But the materials that we do use, we often try to replicate other things. What would happen if we embrace those materials for what they are? So that's sort of an underlying tenet of our design philosophy. So, so in terms of the materials you use for this, you talked about recycling buildings and furniture. Mm -hmm. Is is that something that is new with your projects at the University of Tennessee, or has that been experimented with in other ways and you just took it to a, a different level based on newer technologies? Yeah, for some things, it's been ongoing. Uh, one of the great success stories of recycling in architecture is steel. Mm -hmm. I would say I think it's 80 to 90 percent of steel in the United States is recycled. It's very valuable. And it is very similar to that ABS that we're showing in that there's really no degradation. You, you can melt that down, you can uh, recast it as ingot, or you can extrude it as bar stock, whatever you need. It's the same material. It's rather fungible in that regard. So that was one of the things we were looking at as a precedent going forward. There are other things that do get recycled in architecture. Often metals are number one, but you can even uh, recycle jetboard and make new jetboard with it. Concrete can be recycled and make new aggregate out. So those things have been ongoing, but I think what we were interested in is looking at a material that, um, frankly, there's a lot of, a petrochemical ABS. We're probably all on our person right now have something made out of ABS, but we don't recycle it. Uh, and it's kind of a shame to let it go into the, into the landfill. But then we started to think, why isn't it recycled? And part of it is because it's small and variable. It's often used in food uh, packaging, which is very difficult to clean and get ready to be recycled. But what if architecture was making use of this material? Would that make it easier to recycle? And we think the answer is yes. And we've kind of shown it on a few projects that it doesn't degrade uh, aesthetically or structurally. So it's an interesting opportunity. All right. Um, Andrea, you have a question. Hi, yes. Um, so similar to this topic that you brought up, Rushton. Um, and so in my undergrad, we learned about that cradle to cradle concept. So um, creating designs that are meant to be, you know, kind of torn apart and be reused. And so this new technology of 3D printing, which kind of needs to melt it down, right, to a base level, as opposed to using it as its previous intended function. Um, do you see that as a I guess a disadvantage because we're kind of encouraging now the melt, you know, kind of the complete melting down of products as opposed to maybe just deconstructing it and using it in, in another, a different way, but that doesn't need to break it down completely. Yeah, I'm a big fan of McDonough and Brad, Brungart's book, um, Cradle to Cradle is again, one of those tenants that we live by. So in the, in the first projects we showed you, we stayed away from things that were adhesive based, that those projects can be unbolted and reused at the end of their life. And to kind of go to forward to your question, we are using componentized systems. So again, no, um, we're not using anything that could not be removed from that ABS. But the nature of 3D printing is that it does make, you know, the process of, of, of re-extruding it requires it to be melted. Now, what we've noticed, I don't have exactly the number um, off the top of my head, but it's very little energy input once that material is generated. So the raw material takes the, the most of the energy input, and there's a minor percentage that goes back into remelting it. It's a thermoplastic. It can remelt every time. 
So we're kind of in between, right? I, I think uh, for the cradle to cradle philosophy, unless you're making something that basically is that same trillion pavilion again somewhere else, you wouldn't reuse those pieces. But you could absolutely reuse that material and there's nothing stopping you. We're not, uh, we're not creating any uh, barriers to that by adhesive. So it's, it's kind of an in-between condition. Thank you. Speak, speaking to the the energy usage, I mean, it seems like one of the one of the main themes that that comes through with the different projects you talked about is the ability to have things be uh, you know kind of net zero or even energy positive. Um, and is is that something that has been a hallmark of the work at the University of Tennessee? Um, is is that is that a, a kind of your your niche in the uh, in the field? Well, it's something we're interested in. So that's kind of where we started our um, our design research is to, to look at the integration of passive and active systems. Um, and I don't speak for all of the design build work at the University of Tennessee, but the vast majority of it does work with this idea of energy efficiency. Um, I think um, maybe not all of the projects outside of my institute are net zero, but all of the ones that we've worked on have been. And again, that's part of the ethos. Um, and I think one of the one of the things we we're interested in was, is it possible? Um, because you don't often see it. And so we were able to do it in, in 2009, and we've been able to continue on that moving forward. And particularly now in a world where vehicles are likely going to be electrically powered, it makes sense to create a structure that produces more power than it needs. And in an area like East Tennessee, it's uh, sometimes a difficult uh, kind of uh, argument to make. We have inexpensive, relatively inexpensive power from the TVA. But we also have lots of power failures. Uh, we have severe weather. We have forests that are often come crashing down on, on transmission lines. So it also kind of relates to a kind of a condition that we live in here. And also, I think there's an idea of resiliency. It's everyone wants to be able to make their own power and never have to pay another uh, utility bill. Uh, so it is something we try to do in every project. Even Trillium uh, has integrated lighting in it that is solar powered. So it's just, again, kind of built into what, what it is that we try to achieve on every project. Fantastic. Now, you know, think thinking about so many of the different themes being environmentally friendly, you talked a little bit about uh, inspiration that comes from nature, right? And, I, and I'm thinking about biomimicry, you know, kind of the stories that I've seen on it. Is, is that also something that is of special interest to you or or just, just given the kind of natural beauty of Eastern Tennessee, there, there there's kind of a, well, why wouldn't we do it this way, you know, attitude about about approaching, you know, how the design happens there. But really, the, the main thing with the biomimicry is that, you know, as you are introduced to a new material, often when we've seen that in the past, say going well, at the advent of steel, the first thing architects did was they mimicked um, stone, right? They didn't know what steel in, in, in inevitably was going to be good at, which is tension. They first put it in compression. And so there's a while when you can look back there and see these steel buildings with very thin Doric columns made out of steel and iron. So what we're trying to do is jump ahead of that process of mimicking something in the past and trying to figure out what's the actual expression of this material. And so really for us, kind of the, the precedents that, that best serve us are organic, the ones that grow with a, pr a process of accretion and deposition, just like 3D printing. Is. And so that's really it. It's not necessarily about the aesthetics as an applied system. It's about aesthetics as something that emerges from the understanding of the application of the material. Fantastic. Um, let, let's do one more question before we finish the recording. Uh, and that is that in, in working at a university laboratory uh, for, for this kind of effort, you're constantly getting uh, you know, students uh, coming in, being part of the, the teams that do the research and the development. And so you're getting a lot of new perspectives from these students as, as they come in. Do you have kind of moments along the way where, where students uh, in, in coming to be part of the team that does this brought uh, an insight or, or a, a suggestion that really allowed you to see what you were doing in a, in, in a new perspective? Absolutely. Everything that you have seen, believe it or not, was student design. And most of it was student constructed. So this is not me dictating, you know, what the thing should look like or how we should make it. I, I, I come with, you know, a set of interesting research questions and the students have always stepped up to that challenge. Um, 
after we did the solar decathlon, I thought, man, we should quit. We can't top this, right? And I have found that every single time we've engaged the students, we've been able to get results that are that good. Um, and I, I'm just thrilled by that. I think um, a beginner's mind is a wonderful thing. You're not polluted by pe people telling that you that it can't be done because it's never been done. And the students always step up and they find a way. And I'm, I'm just I'm thrilled by that. And that's that's what keeps me doing this. I, I have ultimate optimism. Well, as an educator, that's uh, that, that's that's a perspective that warms my heart for sure. Uh, we'll we'll wind things down for the recording, uh, and then in a minute, do what we always do, which is pass it back to the speaker for the final word. If you are joining us from another Rotary Club, thank you for spending a little time uh, joining our little way of sharing stories uh, within the the space of Rotary, which we see as being space about innovation and especially innovation for making the world better. Uh, and I hope that you will share this recording with others. Uh, you may also let us know you were here. So there is a, a an attendance form that's just a little bit farther down the page on the SiliconValleyRotary.com page and a discuss forum at the bottom where you can share your thoughts about the different things you've heard in this program or any other element of the meeting. As we always like to do, we hand it back to the speaker for the final word. So, James, I hand it back to you. Thank you. Again, thrilled to be here. Happy to have this opportunity to talk about the projects. I would say if I've got kind of one bullet to leave you with, it's amazing what you can do when you don't know it's impossible. So we deal with very complex issues in the Institute. We're looking at housing. We're looking at energy efficiency. We're looking at the life cycle of materials. And all of those things can't be solved if you try to approach them with the same mindset that's already been developing the problem. So I just I feel that that that's an optimistic a way to look at things, and I find that we we build it every day. We make it real. So I'm excited to share that with you. Fantastic. Everyone, we will see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. <laughs>